Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, March 29th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, lawmakers are moving one step closer to Medicaid expansion for the working poor, but discussions remain heated. Then multiple law enforcement agencies are moving into phase two of an operation to crack down on violent crime in Jackson. Plus, March is National Endometriosis Awareness Month. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Senate lawmakers have passed a bill that would expand Medicaid coverage in Mississippi, but the chamber continues to disagree with the House and how it should be implemented. The Senate has inserted their own language into House Bill 1725, which would require someone to work at least 30 hours per week and earn a maximum of $15,000 per year to qualify. They're calling it Medicaid Extension Light. Unlike the House plan, if the state fails to get a federal waiver for the work requirement, there won't be any expansion of the program. Republican Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman supports a Medicaid plan that will cover low-income working Mississippians and says the House's policy was too broad. This is a conservative amendment. If you will note during discussion, they discuss the fact that this was appealed during the Trump administration. And we're going to carry the vote here for President Trump. So you also heard, oh, what happens if they deny it here? If we have a new president, we're going to have this bill passed. So all of these reasons, and I respect the senators that had their discussions. You heard them all. But I also respect the fact that the Senate debated this full and completely in our committees and again on the floor of the Senate today. And what you saw was Mississippi take a step forward to helping each other during what is a um, very holy week for most of us. Hoseman says the Senate's plan will still be enough to help low-income working Mississippians who can't afford private health insurance. Well, the the substance was whether or not we're going to help working people in this state that are making a mom and two children that are making less than $25,000. That's less than $12.50 an hour. we got a lot of people that do that. So the focus needed to be on people. We need to be focused on our, our, the individuals that are in our state that are trying to make it by working. That's what this is about. And you heard it time after time after time. Now, some people want to go back and say this is about some president three terms ago and hopefully four terms ago, but it's not. It's about working people. We consistently have had a low labor force participation rate. I talked about it during the campaign. I talked about helping working people. I talked about it here. And I'm proud of the Senate stepping up and addressing that issue. Now, we have a number of individuals, and we have programmed where this will have a tax on it, which is why we passed it today. It will not cost the state any money at all. We'll have a 3% tax on, uh, on managed care organizations. Our goal here is to have that working mom that's making $25,000 get up to $30,000 and go forward and be on the exchange, go up the next step to where the government pays for this, the next step up, which is Senator Black will point out, is a higher reimbursement rate, which we also desperately need because of our doctors, our hospitals, and our rural health care. During that floor debate, some Republicans raised concerns Medicaid expansion for working people is not necessary. And that's what he was referring to. They claim that disabilities do not directly disqualify someone from the workforce. Higher paying jobs are available and they're weary of fraud within the system. Republican Senator Angela Hill of Picayune spoke against the measure, saying any expansion of Medicaid would open the door for more asylum seekers to qualify. What you may not know, if you have not read CMS's website, is that many categories of what we consider illegals who are coming through the border and claiming asylum who may not have a court date for five to seven years would qualify to get Medicaid. This is not just Mississippi residents, okay? We go by the rules of CMS. No matter what we put in a bill, CMS controls the rules and regulations for Medicaid. 
Democratic senators also spoke on the measure but say it will be too limiting for the people who need it the most. Senator David Blunt of Jackson told the body he is voting for the bill to move on, but hopes the House is able to work with the Senate for a better plan. It's been documented, of course, that Mississippi has refused $1 billion a year, every year for the past 12 years. That's $1 million before lunch today, $1 million this afternoon, and $1 million after we get, go home for supper tonight. One key point that I want to make that is different about the strike law amendment and the House bill, the federal government has said to states that expand Medicaid, and that is to 138% of poverty level, which the strike law amendment does not do. The federal government will provide for two years a total of approximately $624 million to the state's general fund by enhancing the FMAP by 5%. That's more than $600 million. Because of that increase, the state economist has projected that if we were to take the House bill by going to 138% coverage, we would increase the annual GDP of the state by $750 million a year. We would increase the number of jobs in Mississippi by approximately 11,000 jobs every single year. We would increase the income that Mississippi earns every year by approximately $800 million. We would also grow the population of the state. Republican Senator Kevin Blackwell of South Haven chairs the Medicaid committee and authored the measure. He says the House wants a plan for full Medicaid expansion, which he doesn't agree with. I'm still against expansion. This is an expansion. I know there, there are going to be people argue that because you've added people, we've expanded. Uh, but this is really almost like a waiver, as uh, Senator Wiggins was commenting. So I, I don't look at it as expansion. The bill is expected to be sent to conference, where both chambers will meet to come up with a compromise. Whatever plan they pass will need to be veto-proof. Governor Tate Reeves says he opposes any law expanding Medicaid. Coming up, multiple law enforcement agencies are moving into phase two of an operation to crack down on violent crime in Jackson. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Humor, stories, news, music. Our weekend lineup has it all. Tune in to enjoy the relaxed sound of the weekends on MPB Think Radio. We are filled with gratitude to the gracious people who stepped up to tell MPB they love the idea of having Think Radio in their lives. If you missed your opportunity to take part, just visit mpbonline.org. Again, thanks from all of us at MPB. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology or tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. Is Friday your favorite day of the work week? We're pretty proud of our Friday MPB local shows. Felder Rushing's Gestalt Gardener at 9 a.m. is about your garden and life. At 10 a.m., Next Stop Mississippi lets you know the hot events going on around the state. Southern Remedy for Women is for women and the people who love them. Coming up next after Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This is MPB Think Radio. Mississippi is our mission. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Federal, state, and local law enforcement are working together to reduce the capital city's high rate of violent crime. Since Operation Unified was started in January of this year, officials say more than 500 pounds of illicit drugs and 200 illegal firearms have been seized in and around Jackson. Commissioner Sean Tindall heads the Mississippi Department of Public Safety. He says the progress made so far has been a success, and they are now moving into phase two of their plan. During this, 18 firearms have been seized, over $20,000 seized, 
one stolen vehicle recovered, multiple illicit drugs taken off the street, and at least 40 arrests have been made. More arrests are anticipated, and those who are wanted and know they have warrants are encouraged to turn yourself in. Some of the evidence seized during this operation is pictured here today. In two of these pictures, you will see bags of pills that are believed to be fentanyl or ecstasy. These pills are what are being sold on our streets, and it's killing our kids and destroying our neighborhoods. Another picture, you will see two handguns with switches. These are what make these pistols perform at an automatic rate, much like an automatic rifle would dispensing multiple rounds. And the last picture is what was seized from a two-bedroom apartment, around a dozen guns, multiple drugs, and over 12,000 in cash. While executing this warrant, officers were told that two gangs were positioning to go to war. That is the type of behavior we want to take off our streets to protect our capital city, our families, and our friends. The culmination of phase two does not mean this operation is over, and our goal remains the same. I think the success of this op operation demonstrates the power of collaboration between the various levels of law enforcement, and it has been a testament to the power of partnership. Jackson police have been asking for the state's help for years to reduce violent crime in the city. There have been concerns raised about community members the jurisdiction of the state capitol police force, and a lack of communication with JPD. Jackson Police Chief Joseph Wade says Operation Unified has helped to bring everyone to the table and work together. We have dedicated a lot of resources and assets to this operation. Our narcotics unit, our action unit, and also our intelligence unit. Our citizens in the city of Jackson deserve a better quality of life. I'm committed, dedicated, and laser focused to give them a better quality of life. Chief Wade says this partnership is also able to tackle major gang-related issues within the city. It is not traditional as it was back in the 90s when I came on in 1995. We have so many neighborhood factions and pockets of individuals who are gang-affiliated. We have one that has been wreaking havoc across the city. I would not call it a gang war, but these individuals are gang affiliated. And we're taking a very strategic approach to deal with that. We've had talks with the U.S. Attorney, Todd G., and we're talking about bringing in some efforts from the national level to address our gang issue here in the city of Jackson. And yes, I did mention, I'll bring to the forefront that I will be willing to speak and talk to these individuals. And I've had people to reach out to me as far as, as far as way, you know, as far as Boston, Massachusetts, because they did it up there. They met with these individuals who were gang affiliated and it worked and they had a reduction in violent crimes. And I look forward to meet with that individual when he arrives in Jackson, probably in a couple of weeks as to what it looks like. But when I talk about meeting or speaking with these gang members, I'm not talking about calling a truce or giving them a pass. I'm talking about a ceasefire. I'm talking about saving lives because we're losing too many young men in our city to senseless gun violence. Helping prosecute these cases is Hines County District Attorney Jody Owens. Just an hour ago, we got a guilty verdict for murder in Hines County. Last week, a guilty verdict for murder in Hines County. It's our goal to commit a special grand jury for a day just for crimes being prosecuted by Project Unity because we know it, to ensure that the work is finished, we have to make sure those individuals who terrorize our communities will not be allowed to be repeat offenders. And at that point in time, we plan on producing the statistics shown that the individual years and time the individuals receive from Project Unity because projects like this are the start, not the finish, of having a safer capital city. And I assure you, as the Chief Prosecutor of Hines County, we will prosecute everyone possible for these violent crimes, drug crimes, any of the foolishness that we've seen far too long in the city of Jackson. It stops, and you will see that from our office. 
Next, March is National Endometriosis Awareness Month. It's a disease that often goes undiagnosed for years. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The on-air portion of the MPB Think Radio spring campaign is complete, and we are back to uninterrupted programs. We are filled with gratitude to those who took a stand for everything you hear on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Hey, if you missed your opportunity to take part, just visit mpbonline.org. Again, thanks from all of us at MPB. Humor, stories, news, music. Our weekend lineup has it all. Tune in to enjoy the relaxed sound of the weekends on MPB Think Radio. This is MPB Think Radio, Mississippi Public Broadcasting. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Endometriosis is a chronic and painful disease. Some women in Mississippi may not realize they have and are living with it untreated. Research shows it's often underreported. It's estimated one in 10 women may suffer from endometriosis. Our Kobe Vance speaks with Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Associate Professor at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and she's the host of Southern Remedy for Women right here on MPB Think Radio. She says having endometriosis can be very painful for some patients and it can be difficult to identify without seeing a doctor. Essentially, endometriosis um, is a disease of the reproductive tract in women. And so, as we all know, so our uterus, the inside lining of that is called our endometrium. And so what endometriosis is, is when that lining that we normally find inside of the uterus is found outside of the uterus. So you get that tissue that you normally would see there deposited on other areas within the tract. So common places that you sometimes see that tissue could be the ovaries. um, Sometimes it can attach to the bowel or the bladder. And as a result of that tissue being somewhere it's not supposed to be, it can oftentimes present problems. And particularly in women, the most common kind of symptom is kind of this chronic abdominal pain. So how can people tell the difference between their usual period cramps or uh, things like that and this abnormal abdominal pain that you mentioned? So that's a challenging part of endometriosis. So many women go so many years without it being diagnosed, some eight to 12 years sometimes. So we're talking about a while before we kind of get the diagnosis right. So first of all, most of the time endometriosis is going to um, affect women in their reproductive years, typically around the ages of 25 to 35. But again, that's just a range. We can see that before then or even later. And so one thing that is significant about endometriosis is that you oftentimes get this abdominal pain during your menstrual cycle because it is kind of essentially hormone related. Um, So really endometriosis is more of a constellation of symptoms that kind of help point us in the right direction of diagnosing it. So some women will have just kind of like this chronic abdominal pain, lower, um, a a really lower abdomen, pelvic pain. Some people describe more of like a pressure. Um, They can have more severe pain than what you would see in a typical period. They can oftentimes have very heavy menstrual cycles. Um, They can have pain with intercourse. Um, And the thing about it is it's just almost sometimes a more exaggerated pain than you see um, with just a typical menstrual cycle for some people. Um, Other things that can kind of point you in that direction is depending on where that tissue is, where that additional endometrial tissue attached. Some women can have urinary frequency, urgency, or pain on urination. Um, Some people can even see it interfere with their bowel habits, so they can get diarrhea, constipation, abdominal cramping. So it's really one of, that's why, you know, as I say all those things, people are probably listening and saying, I have that right now. Do I have endometriosis? And so that's what makes it so challenging to diagnose and women can go so many years with this problem before we're kind of able to get it right. 
Looking through a few different research papers yesterday, I noticed that the only thing that really seems certain about endometriosis prevalence is how uncertain it is. And that, Correct. you know, the see some estimates show that maybe one in 10 women have endometriosis. Is that what you kind of expect here in Mississippi? Yeah, so you see about 10% um, of women can be affected by endometriosis. Um, one of the things, though, about endometriosis is when we talk a lot about different health disparities um, among different races, one thing that we do see is particularly in African-American women, they're 50% less likely to be diagnosed compared to women of other races. It takes so much longer um, for them to be diagnosed when you're looking at other women. So it, so that kind of even adds more to that, that, you know, there's even more women out there, particularly within our state, you know, that may be dealing with this that might not be diagnosed. Other than pains, is there any other risks that come with endometriosis? So that's kind of a tricky one. Um, because, you know, you'll look at the research and everyone thinks, okay, so now you've got abnormal tissue that somewhere it's not supposed to be. So sometimes that makes you think of different things like cancer. So there is some research that there might be a slight increased risk of things like, um, you know, endometrial, can um, endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, and even things looking into um, breast cancer, even colorectal cancer. But, of course, as with many things, that still needs to be studied. One thing that you do see commonly in women that are affected by endometriosis is infertility. So as I mentioned before, you end up with that tissue outside of the uterus, and so it can affect things like usually found on your ovaries. And so those women can oftentimes deal with a good bit of infertility. What treatments are available? So, you know, just like with many other disorders in medicine, you have some patients that can sometimes have mild symptoms and then some that have pretty severe and debilitating symptoms. So the way we treat them oftentimes is based off of their symptoms. So we typically try to do um, medication options first. So NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the things that we're very familiar with, like um, ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, those types of things can help um, in the treatment of endometriosis. There's also hormonal therapy that we can do, typically in the form of um, birth control or contraceptive pills um, are usually kind of our first line treatments when we're att attempting to treat endometriosis. Because as I've mentioned before, it is related um, to our hormones. And then last question I had is you mentioned earlier that some people might be thinking, well, I might need to talk with my doctor about that. Mm -hmm. How can they approach that conversation and how do they begin to express their concern about this in a way that doesn't make the doctor dismissive? So I always tell patients, you are your biggest advocate. You know, if you are concerned about something, you should be sharing your concerns with your doctor. And if you feel like you're not being heard, then maybe we need to find us a doctor that we can have that relationship with where we feel heard. Um, so I tell my patients, be honest about what's going on. Um, tell them what your symptoms are. What's very helpful when you go to the doctor is I tell people we've got phones, and in your phones there's a note section, or if you're a diary person and you want to jot something down, start tracking your symptoms, taking notes, looking at the patterns, putting dates next to it, those types of things. And so you, when you have a lot of data when you're presenting it to your doctor, that can be helpful too. So I just tell patients to be open and honest when you are presenting your concerns to your doctor. And you could say, hey, you know, I've heard a lot about endometriosis. I'm concerned I may have this, and this is why. Um, you know, so just be open and honest. Dr. Jasmine Kinsey is Associate Professor at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedy for Women. Catch her show live this morning and every Friday at 11 a.m.